There's a point in every software engineer's career where they think, what's next? Do they consider the role of an architect? Do they make a switch to a managerial role? Or deep dive into an individual contributor role? In this episode, I talked to Lee Atchison, who's not only an author and a video course trainer, he has been in the architect role for 20 years. No, that's not total 20 years of experience. He has been in the architect role for 20 years. I pick his brain on questions that I've heard many people ask. What is a good next step for an experienced software engineer? How do they choose between a managerial role and an architect role? And if someone wants to be an architect, what do they have to do? All this and more in this episode of The Artifact. Very happy to have you here, Lee. I, uh, like I mentioned in my email to you, I uh, watched your uh, LinkedIn learning course. Uh, which I'm going to link in this uh, video description for uh, okay. folks to check out. Uh, the The course was a very good uh, introduction to somebody who is uh, considering an architect role or somebody who is a new architect and they're trying to figure out what is going to be different in their in their day to day work. Uh, I I got a lot of value out of it, and I also wanted to uh, kind of you know get you here, uh, introduce you to my audience and uh, ask you some questions. Um, one of the things you mentioned at the very beginning of that LinkedIn learning course is uh, how you've been an architect forever. And I, I saw that, like I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile and you weren't kidding. You, you, you've been, I think the first mention of an architect in your profile was in, uh, I think, 99, 1999. Is that, is that fairly accurate? Oh, let's see. Um, would have been... Uh... 80, uh, 90, yeah, that's right. It would have been 98 or 99, something wow. like that. Right around that range. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I moved to a startup mm -hmm. and, uh, they, you know, I started as a developer, but it's like, they didn't have any architect at all. So mm -hmm. I kind of took on, you know, the natural progressor took on the architect role and, uh, and with a, with new developers that they were bringing on, I was, I was like employee number six for that company. Wow. And, uh, and by the time we, you know, we, uh, we, we grew up, so to speak, we were 25, 30 people I was the, and I was the architect for it. And, uh, and, uh, that was really was my first experience as an architect architect. And you're right. That's 20, uh, 23 years ago now. So yeah, I've been an architect for a long time, but you, you mentioned that line in the, in the uh, course where I said, mm -hmm. I've been an architect for forever. Um, it, it, when I did that line, that was just kind of a throwaway line that I, 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 I said while I was recording it and I. I tried to edit it out and the producer lost it in and, you know, that, that sort of thing. But, uh, um, but it, you know, it's, it, it's gotten a lot of people commenting like, like you about, well, what do you mean by forever? And says, well, you know, for most of my career, you know, I've been a, I, it, I've been a, an architect longer than I've been a developer. And I've actually gone back and done development mm -hmm. a, after being an architect, just because I wanted to do something different. And in some cases, the jobs I had, you had to do both, right? It was right. a dual cool role. So. Right. Uh, yeah. So yes, I have been architecting software for a long time. Can you think back to the time when you kind of decided to be an architect? And uh, you know, I'm curious to see if you had like, were you having like a couple of different options in your mind? Like, okay, I could do this versus becoming an architect, or was it always clear in your mind that? you wanted to be an architect from the beginning yeah it, it it was not clear at all no no not at all uh it, early in my career uh i worked at hewlett packard and at hewlett packard there were two jobs there were developers and then there was the management ladder that brought you throughout the rest of the of the uh you know career opportunities within the organization and that's really all there was at the time and so in my mind the way i i started my career was the developer was step one, step two was be the manager and that's all there was. So I took that step. I became a manager. Um, at, at one point I was a direct line manager for something like 25 engineers and you know, I, I did a good job at it, but I really did care for it. I, I, I was not, you know, the, the, the management aspects of a large group like that was not, you know, it kept me from doing all the other things I wanted to do. When, when you have 25 direct reports, you spend all day in one-on-ones and mm -hmm. you don't, you can't do any strategic planning, any long-term planning. You can't make any really concrete decisions other than spur of the moment decisions. 
And that strategic planning was something that I discovered that I really enjoyed doing. So I, I've, I've been manager at, in other spots in my career and certainly at, uh, at Amazon in particular, I was a manager and even at New Relic, but that was never a focus anymore of what I wanted to do. You know, uh, being a manager of a few people was a means to an end as opposed to my career goal. My career goal was, as I expressed it to my managers at the time was I wanted to increase the breadth of my responsibility versus the depth of my response. I cared mm -hmm. more about the big picture than I did about the details of a little picture. That was just kind of the, the direction I, I personally was interested in. And it's different people like different things, but for me, that's what I really wanted to do. And yeah. I didn't know it at the time, the word architect wasn't really in your vocabulary at the time. Uh, but that's really what it ended up being that I really wanted to be. And I, I, I didn't really figure that out until I became an architect. Uh, so in that, that role I was talking about, it was a startup. I was employee number six, brought in as a developer, a uh, remote developer, no less. I, 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 I tell everyone I, I was living in Colorado and I was moving to Pennsylvania. So of course I took a job with the Silicon Valley company. And <laughs> so I spent all my time in airplanes and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, but I really enjoyed that role because I went from, you know, a, a cog in a giant machine of Hewlett Packard into, you know, the primary one responsible for most of the product mm -hmm. in, uh, in a startup and, uh, and that gave me the breath that I wanted. And so as I grew in the breadth of responsibility and, and, um, you know, Brett, you know, the rest of the team, you know, the team grew and everyone ultimately ended up having to look to me for the direction of the product because I'm the one that understood everything, how it all fit together. And then naturally occurred that, that I kind of went into this architect role and, uh, uh, you know, they, it came to a point where, you know, the company was looking to sell to someone else and they were sort of formalize some things and we each you know, I got some a couple of pay raises and all that sort of stuff. And they said, we, we need a good title for you. And I had no idea. I said, well, senior developer, whatever. I didn't, I didn't really care, but they said, how about, uh, chief architect? And I really liked that title, but I really didn't know what that meant, but I, it sounded like the right thing to do. And as I read more and realized that's really what I was already doing. I was being an architect and I just didn't even know what that term was at the time. You know, back in the, back in the nineties, it wasn't a common term that was used to describe, you know, that, this type of an organization. So, you know, it, it, it fit perfectly and I really enjoyed that role. And, and I'll tell you throughout the rest of my career, the times when I could focus on architecture were, were the times I enjoyed the most. Mm -hmm. There were lots of other things I've done in my career, which were great, uh, including my current job. Um, but, uh, the times when I was a direct hands-on architect were by far my favorite. So you truly found your calling with, uh, Definitely. with architecture. So you, your responsibilities kind of like the, you know, you talked about the breadth versus depth. I think the breadth kind of increased twofold because first of all, you're moving from like this big, uh, company like Hebel Packard to a startup and that move in itself increases a breadth of responsibility to, to anybody, even if you were kind of having a, an equivalent position in the startup. But then you also shifting to an architect role, which, which increases the breadth. Um, doesn't that, uh, so this breadth versus depth, uh, discussion, isn't that something that, uh, is natural to any career progression? So, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're an architect or a manager or whatever else. Uh, my impression is that, you know, when you are, when you're just new to the industry and you're an individual contributor, you do have a certain area of influence, but as you grow in the industry, you're expected to take on more. You're expected to widen your uh, area of influence and impact. So how do you see that, uh, that natural progression of increasing impact versus this kind of increase in impact you get by becoming an architect? Is there, is there a significant difference there? That's actually a great question. So I think, I think a lot of people think that, but you know, some of the most successful engineers I've seen have been extremely focused, but they've had a very high, very deep silo of responsibility, but not very much breath. Uh, matter of fact, my very first manager, when I started working at Hewlett Packard, um, was a very, very senior person within the organization. And he built a, um, 
a communication channel for this product that they're working on. And that's all he did was this narrow communication channel. It mm. was, uh, um, it was, it was, they called it uh freak ports is what it was called because his name was Frank, which is was what his last name was. And, but within the entire organization, everybody was using this one capability. Um, but it was a very, very narrow piece of functionality, but he was the expert on it. He knew everything about it. He expanded it. The, the, um, the importance of that one piece of functionality was critical to the operating of the entire system that we were building. So he was highly focused on that. And he was one of the most senior, most experienced, the most, um, uh, technically proficient engineer in the organization, but at a very, very, very narrow focus. So you don't have to broaden your responsibility in order to grow your career. Um, mm. I think a lot of people do, and a lot of people assume that you do. And certainly that's a good way to grow your career is to broaden your responsibility. But it's not essential. Uh, becoming really, really good at one thing also is a good way to grow your career. Now, the caveat I'll put in to that is, again, the, you know, back in the 80s versus now, um, people are a lot more mobile in their careers now than they were then. Mm. And so uh, now, because of mobility, it's you know, having flexibility and having um, breadth of knowledge is incredibly important. So this, that's, that's a great um, skill set to have. But that doesn't mean that in your day-to-day -day responsibilities, you have to be responsible for a wide breadth of product and still be focused on a specific piece of functionality mm. and do very, very well with that piece of functionality. That was kind of an assumption that I was making because there's always this argument about, uh, you know, you're hiring someone who has a lot of, uh, you know, experience in the industry and you're probably paying them more than somebody who's fresh out of college. So you would expect someone who was hired at that level to perform way more, right? So they have to be like, I'm not going to use the, the 10 X engineer term, but they have, they have to deliver on, uh, you know, somehow leverage their experience or leverage their skills to deliver more than somebody who a company could easily hire by paying much less. So most of the times that that increase in impact is basically by scaling it to like having it be broader than narrower. So I, I, I see what you're saying about like if you if you're razor focused on one thing and that is a high impact uh, initiative, it would make sense for somebody to uh, for a company to hire like a 20 years experience or even a 10 years experience person to work on it. But do, do you feel that those opportunities are kind of few and far between? Most of the times you would want someone experienced to broaden their scope rather than focus on an individual thing? Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, when we were talking ahead of time, you used the word scarce, right? Are these opportunities scarce for what you yeah. do? And I, I actually don't like that word because, uh, you know, I, I focus on scaling and, it, and one of the tenets of scaling is that there's always opportunity. Uh, and, and that's, I think that same thing's true from a career standpoint too. You know, you, it may appear that, that things are scarce, but it's more because of the filters you've put on, put on things. Right? So for instance, if, if your goal is, I want to be the architect for this capability in this company, in on this team, and I want that role. Yeah. That's a scarce commodity. There's one of them or a small number of them. And may be more people interested in that role and there may already be someone in that role. That might be a hard thing to get. But if your interest is, I want to be an architect in this piece of functionality or this general area, and I want to be a special specialist in, uh, in scaling. Like I, for me, I was an architect in the availability and scalability. That's what my focus was on. You want to be an architect in that. There's tons of opportunities in that area that allow you to focus on that whether it's in the same company, same team, same company, or other companies, um, mm -hmm. it, it really is not scarce. And, and so I think finding the area that you want to focus in and, and where you want to focus on, and even if that involves being broader versus narrower, I think that itself is a focus, right? Being broader is a focus, um, being responsible for the thinner versus the deeper is a, is a, a focus to take. Um, it may not be an opportunity available to you today in 
um, the organization you're currently in and the group you're currently in, but that doesn't mean the opportunities aren't there, um, either today in other organizations or tomorrow, even in your organization. That makes sense. And also, if I can say a lot of times, you know, we, especially if you're working for a growing organization, and I will say there's a very difference between if you're in a large enterprise that is relatively stable in size versus a growing company, a startup or, you know, a, a dot com company or some sort of company that's growing very, very quickly. Um, because in that, in that latter case, the role that you're going to have tomorrow doesn't exist today. And part of your job is to create that role. So if you find a need for something that doesn't exist today, that doesn't mean that that role won't exist tomorrow yeah. and preparing yourself for that role and making it clear that you're, you are the right person to have that role. You're going to be the natural fit for that when that position actually does get created, or in fact, be the encouragement for the company to create that position. Yeah. It's very different than a enterprise at space that's pretty stable in size. And that's a different, different beast. But in the growing organization, opportunities are created by you. They're, they're, they're not things that you have to wait till they open. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's a lot of, uh, you know, that's a big draw for people to get into these kind of a startup environment because you can make those, make those opportunities for yourself. Um, uh, I want to touch back on the, uh, the point that you mentioned earlier about like when you were getting to an architect, you had this manager versus architect, uh, decision to make and you kind of played around with both. Uh, I have had a lot of people ask me about that, right? And it seems, it see, almost seems like a natural progression of a, a software developer's career at some point of time. Um, let's say they're 10 years in or 15 years in, they're going to go, okay, now what next? Do I become a manager? Do I become an architect? And I've heard all this advice about like, yeah, if you, if you like, you know, working with people, then you become a manager, otherwise you become an architect. And they go, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you are an architect, you have to be working with people as well. That's probably not a good reason to switch. Even as a senior engineer, you need to exactly be working with people. Exactly. Yeah. We, we live in a society, <laughs> so we have, we have to deal with people. Um, what do you think is a, a good kind of, you know, way to gauge where somebody would need to go? Like if somebody was asking sure. you that advice, what would you tell them as a good barometer for choosing one versus another? Sure. That, and that, that is a great question. I, to me, uh, the thing that I've learned, I think early on is that a manager, even a technical manager is not a step above an engineer. It's a different career path. It's a different set of responsibilities. It's a different set of skills to be a manager. It, the, the things that make you good at, at an engineer and the things that make you good at a manager aren't necessarily complementary. They're a very different set of skills. And so I think uh, I find the best managers that I've ever had have actually been pretty mediocre engineers or certainly whether they, they, they you know, whether they were mediocre engineers or not, don't pay attention to this. Uh, they were, uh, they, if they weren't the, the lead engineers or the, you know, they didn't get the job of a manager because of how they excelled as an engineer. Um, and I will also say some of the worst managers I've ever had have been engineers that have just said, well, I need to do another career step here. Let me just go into management. That includes me, by the way, I think I'm not as, wasn't as effective as a manager as other managers were, because that isn't what my skill set is for. So, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, if you're thinking about the question about, you know, I need to do a career step beyond being an engineer today. Should I go into management? You're asking the wrong question. The question you should be asking is. Of all the opportunities, and let's talk about all the different opportunities available to me, of all the opportunities for me to do in my career beyond just being a engineer that I'm doing right now, what's the next step? Uh, management is one of them, but it's a set. Do I have the skills that are appropriate for that? Mm -hmm. Do I have the interest that's appropriate for that? I'll tell you, if you hate meetings, don't be a manager. I mean, you know, that's, that's just the way it works. And a lot of engineers hate meetings. Don't do that, but there's lots of other things you can be. You can certainly, most companies have a senior engineer route as well now too, right? Where you can 
keep moving up very, very high within the organization, very, very high within the, the, um, the value chain and therefore the salary range on the engineering track that's separate from the management track and separate from the architecture track. Being an architect was not the same thing as being a senior engineer. There, there are different career tracks. But also there's a, there's a brave new world of operations that's been, um, that your know, SAS in particular has opened up, but there's certainly, uh, it's certainly been around for a lot longer than SAS has been around, but SAS has opened up the need for developer focused operation individuals. And you know, of course, DevOps being the, uh, the, the main, but not only avenue into that. Um, and that's a different set of skill sets that is very unique and different that often gives you better career paths as well, too. And even security, you know, there's, there's a lot of career opportunities and senior roles in security that depend on a high level of knowledge and expertise coming from a developer that are, that's coming in. So your developer expertise can be a springboard to lots of different directions, not just management, not just architecture. But those certainly are two of several options that are available. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, we there is this um, there's also this uh, you know a follow up question then about like you know you said well go with what your um, what your skills uh, take you right your your I should just say skills and passion right their passion okay. they, they they go together yeah passion yeah. you have to be passionate for what you're doing right right. No, that makes sense because, you know, the, the problem with skills is you don't quite know what you're skilled at until you start doing it. So passions is a great point. And uh, one other thing that I always say is don't go away from something. So uh, there is there is this uh, common trend where people go like, yeah. So this is true for most industries, but specifically for software industry, it's like it, it changes a lot. So there is this constant need to learn and keep yourself updated, right? So a lot of people go like, yeah, this is something that I cannot find myself doing another 10 years, right? This is, this is overwhelming me and, you know, I, I will, I will have to do something so that I don't have the need to constantly learn at least at that rate and keep myself up to date. And that's the reason why they switch. So, well, my, my, my response to that would, would be like, you know, you, you, you're finding a problem in what you're you know, what you're seeing as your next step in your career trajectory and, and you're trying to go away from it. That's really not a good starting point, right? You should, you should always go towards something you're passionate uh, about rather than going away from something that you don't like. If you feel like the software engineering, like, you know, the individual contributor stream is not for you, then fine, it's time for you to consider a switch, but then see what is what is more appealing, what draws you in rather than just find the next thing to find, you know, just jump at the next uh, opportunity that comes your way. So, um, uh, do, do you Absolutely. agree? Absolutely. I mean, that's a fantastic way to view. If, if you don't like what you're doing, or if it isn't a, if you're getting tired of it and want to do something different, you don't have to follow the traditional paths of that role upwards. You can do laterals and do lots of different things to stay in the same high tech area. If that's, if you're excited about high tech, but you don't have to, you know, stay as a software engineer. Um, there's, there's a, I'll tell you, there's a huge opportunity for people who are highly skilled engineers to work in sales and marketing, and not as a salesperson, not as a marketing person, but as a subject matter expert to help the organization build content. I, I actually spent some time doing that at New Relic where I, when my book came out, I was, you know, an architect for New Relic and this book came out. And they decided they wanted to put me on the road and the tour to talk to customers and things like that. <laughs> and while you're here, can you also give us, you know, can you make sure these blog posts, do they look technically accurate? And can you write some blog posts for us? And can you do all of this? And, and I ended up actually really enjoying a lot of that to the point where mm -hmm. that's kind of the sort of work that I'm doing now as my, as a consultant, I'm, I'm doing a lot more of that. I'm doing the both types of con, uh, consulting, both engineering consultancy but also the marketing consultancy. And I really enjoyed that. It was okay. very different, very different than the role I was doing as a traditional architect. Yeah. But it's a, it's, you know, at the, at the stage where I am in my career now, it's, it's you know, very far <laughs> along and near the end, you know, I'm, I'm in my last years before I started thinking about retiring. Um, but for me at that stage, 
being the subject matter expert and helping others learn is exactly what I want to do. And whether those people who are learning are engineers, engineering management, or marketing, sales, customers, whatever that is, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy passing on knowledge. And that's, that's just kind of the way it works. Same. That's not what you would think. That's not what I would have thought I would have been doing back when I was a developer. Cause I said, me, I don't code every day. Why would I want a job that I don't code every day? Right. Uh, and the fact of the matter is it's been a few years since I've been significant amount of coding, a little bit here and there, but not significantly. It's just not the direction I'm headed with my career right now. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, is it safe to assume now, Lee, that you've done pretty much everything <laughs> that it's to be done? It's like, I keep hearing new stuff that you've done. No, I, 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 I appreciate what you said there. And, you know, people tend to uh, not take those opportunities because they're scared that they might, it might look bad on their resume for whatever reason. But honestly, it looks good on your resume. Yeah. It honestly does. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So let's say somebody did find that their passion is with becoming an architect and they are, uh, let's say, a senior engineer in a company. Uh, what do you think they should be doing in order to kind of get this, get themselves there, both in terms of getting themselves skilled as well as creating opportunity for themselves in that, organ you know, in that organization? Yeah, I think you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in the, the way you get a job is you do the job, right? Mm. And so... Look for an opportunity and do the, do, do the work. I, I think the, what that means for an engineer today that wants to become an architect is several things. One is first start thinking of the big picture. You, you, you have a job, you have to focus on your service, your module, your component, whatever it is that you're responsible for, but start thinking outside of the box and start thinking about how the decisions you make and the decisions that your team makes and your manager makes impacts outside of just your small little bubble and the impact of the organization and start sharing that with, you know, you know, not only with yourself, but with your teammates and with your manager and start being the expert on how all, all of these things fit together. Mm -hmm. Um, that means improving people skills. People skills are important for everybody as we talked about, but you know, you can always keep improving those means um, increased interactions with other parts of the organization. It means not being afraid of talking to marketing, not being afraid to talk to product management, not being afraid to talk to sales or customers, spend some time in support. Uh, it, it means understanding the breadth of what else is going on and how what you're doing fits into the whole. Once you start doing that, you'll start getting noticed and your manager will notice your, uh, their manager will notice and, and that will lead you in the right direction that will, you know, when opportunities open up or get created where your name will be a natural fit for, or like I say, if you're in a smaller organization in particular, you can help create those opportunities by doing that. Say, so, Hey, this is really turning into a full-time job. Well, why don't I just start doing this full time and you hire another developer to do the things I was doing, you know, and that's, that's a natural. It's kind of what happened with me, right? And that's mm -hmm. just a natural way for things to, to, to go. Um, but if you're in this smaller or in the larger organization, that's more stable in size, you need to be looking for the opportunities. And by doing the rest of making your interconnections with what you're doing to other parts of the organization, you're going to start seeing when other organizations, you're going to, your the number of people you interact with is going to increase dramatically. You're going to start seeing opportunities in other parts of the organization as well. And the, the next career leap for you may not be within your group, but maybe within another group that you now have been working with. They've been working with you. They know who you are and it's a yeah. natural fit. Yeah. You know, it's when I was at Amazon, my, the first role I had at Amazon was running the, um, the migration team that was moving the retail side of the company from a monolithic application to a service oriented architecture. It was uh, moving from what we call mm -hmm. Obidos, which was the monolith, to Grupo, which was a service-based architecture. And uh, that was a multi-year project, high visibility, lots of engineers. I think at one point we had 100 and some engineers working on the migration at once. And when I was done with that, you know, I always knew that job was going to end, the migration was going to finish, that the role I was in was going to go away. 
And I always wondered what I would do next within the company. But what I found is when that role finished, I was inundated with uh, people throughout the organization who wanted me to come and work in their, in their group because they knew me and they knew what I could do. I'd mm -hmm. worked with them already. They wanted my expertise brought into their organization. There were plenty of opportunities for me. Right. And so, you know, the, that only happened because I had a, you know, a breath of influence and a breath of responsibility and a breath of interaction. And I was, I made sure I wasn't focused on just, you know, migrating the detail page or migrating search and browse, which are the two things I was initially hired to do. But I focused on the entire stack and the entire um, migration project as a whole as we went forward. That's a, that's a bit of a mindset change, isn't it? And you do mention that in the, in your LinkedIn learning course as well. Uh, we are, you know, think back, if I, if I think back to like, well, you know, like graduated from college and joined this job and I kind of took that mindset off and this is what happens in an educational institution, right? You're, you're focused on yourself and your performance. And there is, there's almost this fair assessment of your performance in, in, uh, in the universities though, fair. Uh, and then, uh, you, you get to work and then you're, you're again, given a task and then your, your goal is to get that task done the right way and make sure that you're meeting the expectations. So it's all focused inward. And at some point of time, you're getting to this architect role where it's all about a team and about getting objectives complete. I would imagine the transition is more gradual because, you know, you just don't wake up one day and go like, yeah, I'm going to be outward facing and thinking about the team. Uh, what, you know, do, do you see that as a, a challenge in people that you work with, like trying to sh change from that inward focus to looking outward and having a broader focus? So for me, it kind of came naturally and, and, and I'll be honest, I think that's, you know, as you're starting to look at what you want your next career path to be how natural of a progression that is, is probably, you know, one of the skills to look at as to whether or not an architect is the right sort of role for you. Um, you know, we talked about skills versus passion mm -hmm. and I, I really don't differentiate them as much. I'm not talking about skills, meaning I, I know C++, I know Java, I know Ruby, I know, you know, and I've got five years of experience in the language that's only three years old. Yeah. <laughs> None of those sorts of things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what you're good at doing. And it's not just the, the specific tasks assigned to you, but who you are and what you do. And, right. and if you have a natural inclination to want to, to want to explore outside of the bounds given to you, well, that's what an architect needs to do. Right. You have the natural inclination to, to want to broaden your influence. That fits yeah. well into that. But if you have a tendency to say, no, I, f I want to find a better way to do this algorithm, then that's more of the senior engineer route. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a, if, if you have a natural tendency to say, I like making this work and keep it working and keep it going and keep it moving. Well, that's an operations focus. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you have a natural tendency to say, you know, I wonder what happens if I poke here and make this break here and do all this sort of stuff. Well, that's, you know might be quality, but it might be security. You might right. be interested in the security focus. Whatever it is, your skills are, you know, the ingrained skills in you, not the specific technical skills you have, but the ingrained skills, which really is, is visible via what your passion is, right? That's how it, it, it comes out of you through your passion. Um, but that's, what's going to give you the clues as to the direction to take your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had someone who took my class, responded to me on, on, on LinkedIn and said, wow, that's a, that's a lot of work and there's a lot of things you have to do. And boy, as a result of doing all those things, you're not going to, you still have to do all the things you were before. So your job's harder. It says, what I, why would I want to do all of that? And I responded back and says, well, you don't, mm -hmm. you, you probably don't want to be an architect because if you're not passionate about these things, this is not the job for you. And they wrote back and said, you know, wow, you, you just saved me years <laughs> of struggling in my career because I, he had always been, I, I believe it was a key actually. No, yes, it was a key. Um, he was always focused on 
on the next step was to be an architect. I had mm -hmm. to do that. And it turned out he wasn't interested in it. He just didn't know it yet. His passion was in a different direction. And so, um, you know, that's really, I think the most important thing is to, as you're looking at that directional growth, mm -hmm. even if your organization has these predefined paths and expectations and assumptions for the direction you bring with your career, that doesn't apply to you. Mm -hmm. What applies to you is whatever makes sense from your passion, the direction you want to go. And if you don't know what that is, figure it out. Because you're going to be doing that for, for years. So you better right. have you that figure it out now or you'll figure, figure okay. it out slowly over years in a yeah. job that you don't like. You know? yeah. So here's another, uh, you know, kind of a, a shift that I have found in my um, transition, Lee. And I'm, you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So apart from this inward focus and, you know, your self performance focus versus looking at a broader scope, there's also this, um, you know, kind of like objectivity to the output of an individual contributor. So you're, they're given a task and there is a very clear definition of done. It's like, okay, when these act, you know, criteria are met, your job is done, you move on to the next job. You don't quite have that as an architect, at least not when you're working on it. So there is a little bit of a gray area there. Like you, you, you think you've come up with something that meets the company's needs, but then you don't know if it's quite right. How do you deal with that kind of fuzziness in, you know, you know, yeah, basically that, that's my question. How do you deal with not knowing what a complete job is and when it's successfully done? It, it, that, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I like, you know, when you focused initially too, on when, when a developer moves out of college, they're, they're, they take courses, they get tests, they get grades, they right. move in the developer role and they, they're given assignments, they do the work, they're given a graded DR and that's just the way it goes. Yeah. And you just keep going down that way. But life doesn't work that way in general. You know, the developer role very much does work that way. Or at least the junior developer. The junior developer. And yeah. up to some level within the organization works that way. Yeah. But life doesn't work that way. And things change as you get, get older, more mature, maturity starts setting in as well. You know, you, you don't know what the right answer is and the right answer is not clearly defined and you will never have a clearly defined right answer. And mm -hmm. nobody will tell you that you're right. That's the right answer. Yeah. You have to figure that out for yourself by, um, you know, the experience of what actually happens and the responsibility that goes with that. Um, so that's just, you know, it's, it is that itself is a skill and that itself is a scary set of of changes that occur, but in many ways, that's a, that's part of the maturing process in general with any person, as well as any career. And I think the same thing is true to the developer. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the developers, you will get out of this role where it's very clear cut, clearly defined. And if you're not, if you're still in that role where it's clear cut and clearly defined. Uh, maybe it's time to start challenging yourself and to get an opportunity where that's not the case. Or if you're still new at it, then enjoy it while you can, because it's not going to last forever. Um, you know, so I, I don't think that's necessarily a great answer to your question. You know, I, I guess what I'm really answering your question by saying is, you know, we'll get used to it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what the answer is. I mean, it, but it's, it really is the truth. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's part of life and it's not just the job it's it's all of life and, yeah uh, and you, the ambiguity is going to be your friend whether you, it's either going to be your friend or your enemy but it's going to be and, then, and you just have to uh, you're better off making it your friend than your enemy. so uh when you're with you being an architect and you i think you kind of get a sense for what uh the kind of like the subset of right answers are because First of all, like you won't know what the right answer is, is uh, a very valid point. There's another valid point, which is that, is there even a right answer? There are, there could be multiple, right? So it's uh, your job as an architect, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to kind of get to one of the possible right answers based on what the business expectations are and stuff like that. Um, do you do you do you have some practices to kind of make sure that you're you're getting to the 
you know, among the ideal right answers. Like, do you have any data-driven way of doing it? Like, you know, say there are functional requirements or non-functional requirements. Uh, do you have some processes to make sure that, okay, I'm, I'm going to architect something and I'm going to set up some kind of a monitoring system to make sure that I get that, that feedback loop to make sure I'm on the right track to kind of solve this problem of, like, I don't know what the answer is. How do you, how do you approach yeah. this? Yeah, so, so most of the time, the, the feedback loop happens before for an architecture world specific. The feedback loop happens long before it's implemented. So you can't wait to see whether it actually works, which is very frustrating and very hard, right? Because mm -hmm. by the time you've implemented it, it's too late to make any changes, right? It's, mm -hmm. or, if it, or, or actually that was the wrong thing to say because it's, it's never too late to make changes. <laughs> but, uh, in fact. But, but the, the changes get a lot costlier. It gets costlier, the yeah. you, 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 you go yeah. on. So, um, so you, you end up doing feedback loops very early in the process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times the feedback loops are, are, um, are not involving the code at all. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I talk a lot about, um, you know, the, the three things that architects do, you know, self, others, and systems, you know, they, they self. They have to learn and experiment. They, when a new cloud service comes out, you know, whether there's any practical need for it or not, they need to learn what it's about because it might be interesting. It might be useful someday. It might give them ideas. Others is the training and coaching and the helping others to, to become better at whatever the job they're doing. And the systems is reviewing the plans and guidance and the, the architectures of making constant adjustments as we go along. Mm -hmm. What we were talking about here is that last one, the systems. Right. But that is the last of the three that's dependent on the other two being done effectively. Mm -hmm. So when you're making the decisions and doing the feedback and figuring out, is this the right decision? Well, or is it one of the right decisions or is it at least an acceptable decision of the trade-offs I have to make? And even if it's not the perfect decision, but it's the one that makes sense given the criteria we have. You know, the, you're going to get feedback from lots of people and all of that feedback, I guarantee you, uh, lots of people, lots of things, lots of systems, lots, you know, the application itself, customers, everyone, everything. And rarely, if ever, does all that feedback align. So your role at that point, you can't just generate a feedback loop that tweaks when you get feedback that makes adjustments to the feedback because the feedback is all inconsistent. So it's not a simple feedback loop. It's not a simple thing that says, well, I'll make a changes as I go along. It's, it's having the experience, the knowledge, the mental mindset to be able to understand what of the feedback is important and what isn't. And having the judgment to be able to say, regardless of the feedback, what I'm suggesting here makes sense, mm -hmm. or regardless of the feedback, what I said yesterday wasn't right. It needs to be this instead. And, and being able to make those judgment calls in full view of contrary data is really the, 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 the pinnacle of what the architect has to be concerned with. And I'll tell you when you're doing that, uh, your, um, your confidence, when you first start doing that, your confidence is shaky thin because you're making assumptions, you're, you're, or at least it should be right. I mean, if it, if it isn't, you know, that's called cockiness and maybe you're not making the right decision, right? But. But if you're making a decision for the company mm -hmm. and you're not making a decision for yourself or a team, you're making a decision for the company and you've got data that says your decision is wrong, but you stick with it. That's a, that the feeling of doing that, it, am I making the right decision? Am I doing the right thing? Is a very, very, very shaky ground. It feels, it feels very shaky to be on. Mm -hmm. But boy, you make a few of these decisions that end up being the right decision. And that helps your confidence immense. Right. And it makes you really feel that what you're talking about really is, is correct. 
makes you want to write a book and do all these <laughs> things. But, um, you know, but like you say, rarely is there one answer, which also means rarely is the feedback all consistent. Right. How do you, so, how do you get uh, better at that though? Is it, is it mainly just experience? It's experience. Yes. The, the, um, you, you, you first of all, you have to have a thick skin. Absolutely have to have a thick skin. Uh, you also have to, um, have a good filter on what you're told. Hmm. When someone tells you something, you have to understand the context of what they're telling you, why they think that's important and the value of that to your decision, which may or may not be the same as the value they put on. So you have to have the filters that go with that. Yeah. Um, and you have to have the ability to communicate your vision and your direction, mm -hmm. because if you disagree with the direction that someone suggests, part of your job is to convince them the direction you are going is the right direction, get them on board. And. Um, make them understand why you're doing something differently. And, um, and that's, pra that's, that's experience, that's practice, that's confidence. And confidence comes from experience and practice. Okay. Sense. All right. I'm, I'm going to ask you about the, uh, you know, uh, since you are the, uh, you've been the forever architect, I want to ask <laughs> you how you've found the, the role of an architect. Uh, evolve over the years. Have you seen shift, major shifts there? You know, we talk about application architecture, system architecture. Now we talk about cloud architecture. Like, how do you see those solution shifts happening? Uh, yeah, yeah, solution yeah. architects. It, is it basically the same underneath, or has there been a, a you know a significant shift? Well, I, I think there's there's two fundamental types of roles that are called architects, and uh, um, and there's the you know, the traditional architect, this is the one that works on some aspect of a product or a service or a company or whatever. And I'll just keep it that general for a moment. And then there's the solution architect, which is more focused on, on, um, the cost on, on creating customer compelling solutions that go along with what's going, going on. Those are two very different views of what an architect. One of them is very much building an organization. The other one's very much, um, helping to make the organization successful through selling and through customer interactions and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to separate those two out and almost everything I talk about is about the traditional architect, mm -hmm. but within a traditional architect, you know, the difference between a product architect and a cloud architect and a systems architect. The difference between all of those is just what their focus is. Mm -hmm. so even when I talk about breath and responsibility for breath, still within the architecture roles, there's places you can focus. There's things you can do that are, that are, um, become your specialty, if you will. Uh, one of my specialties, as I mentioned, was on scaling and availability. That actually is a focus, um, at cloud, obviously with my experience at AWS, uh, cloud architect experience as well, too. Um. But those are just specialties within that traditional architect wall. And it's also pretty easy to move around, um, uh, within those. I, I tend to tell people that if you're an architect, it doesn't matter if you're a systems architect or a cloud architect or a, or, or whatever, you can do all of those jobs or you can move around within all those roles and this may be value in doing that moving around. Um, don't pigeon self, pigeonhole yourself into one area. If your first job was a systems architect, that doesn't mean your next job has to be a systems architect. Mm -hmm. You can still stay an architect, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, but, um, but maybe it's time to look into, uh, um, uh, becoming a cloud architect and mm -hmm. taking some training and remember that first of the three premises self learning and experiment, maybe it's time to start looking, become a cloud architect or to expand your tool set to include cloud capabilities. Right. Um, I have a, like, we are, I see we're uh, pretty close to time. I do want to ask you about the book that is, uh, sitting behind you, architecting for scale. <laughs> this is a book that I do plan to learn, uh, you know, to read and learn from, uh, can you, can you tell our audience about the book? Why, what is in that sure. book and why you wrote? 
Sure, sure. So this is actually the second edition of the book. The first edition came out in 2016. I um, What happened was, you know, I, I spent seven years at, at uh, AWS and then Amazon learning how to build high availability systems at scale. And that's just all you do at Amazon, right, is you build high availability systems at scale. And that was very much the, the mindset of everything that went on. Then I started working at New Relic, which at the time, New Relic was yeah, bigger than a startup, but not the size of the company it is today. There was about 100 people total in the entire company. The entire development organization fit around a lunch table in the Portland office. There was one table that we, we went to eat, grab food together, and came back and ate together as a tea, as a entire development organization every day. So it was um, it is a small company, and it, but yet they were going through growing pains, right? They were growing rapidly, tons of of import of data coming into the system, and they were running into availability and scalability problems. And, uh, and, and as we, they started struggling with some of these things, I, you know, I would come up and say, well, we just do this. And they said, oh, wow, that's a great idea. And I said, well, why aren't we just naturally doing that? That's what everybody does. Right. And w- what I learned was that, no, it's not what everybody does. It's what Amazon does because Amazon knows how to do this very, very well. But very, at that time, very few other people knew how to do those skills and the, the, the young New Relic organization didn't have any of those. So as I, I kind of took on that role of the, um, you know, the availability architect, if you will, as well as other things. And, um, and what I realized is that there was a lot of companies that needed these sort of skill sets that didn't necessarily have them. And that's what drove me to write the book. So, um, I, what the book is, is my experience is primarily from Amazon, but throughout my career. That leads me to help you build highly scalable, highly available, modern digital applications. And, uh, the book came out in 2016 and, uh, they're very, very successful, very popular. And as soon as the book came out, um, I started going on a, a road trip with New Relic. I'd go to all of the AWS summits. I'd go to, uh, conferences and customer visits, book signings, all that sort of stuff. And talk to a ton of customers, tons and tons and tons of customers and, um, learned about every single one of those customers wanting to share their problems and their challenges. And so a lot of the research that I had done for the book all was correct, but there's a whole bunch more information that came out that I'd learned. And, uh, that led me to want to do the second edition. So if you've read the first edition, definitely read the second edition as well, because it's a. So first of all, it's about 30% more information. It's, it's a bigger book, but it's also completely rewritten and reorganized to make it easier to understand and follow key tenets of the process of building modern application. And now it's not just about building a scalable application. It's about building modern application, microservices, risk management, um, you know, IOT, uh, uh, not much on the AI, but, uh, but the premises involved, um, but it's about building modern applications at scale. And so if you're an architect, if you are, are a, you know, director of engineering, a director of operations, um, a senior engineer or someone that's striving to be one of those roles, it's, it's a good book that would give you a. A, a high level, broad view of what's involved in making it happen. It doesn't go deep in any of these topics, but I think it gives you a high level, broad view of what it takes to build a modern application today. Sounds super interesting. I'm, I'm honestly planning to read it. Uh, well, thank you so much, Lee, for, uh, for joining us and, and sharing your, your thoughts and your, uh, your experiences. My apologies for the initial hiccups with the recording, but, uh, you know, this, this is, this is super valuable. I'm very grateful that you took your time to, uh, to speak with me. Uh, hopefully I will get a chance to talk to you again. So thank you so much. Is, is there anything else that you'd like to share, uh, about any projects you're working on or anything else to our audience? Um, well, sure. Uh, I, I could talk about, uh, my LinkedIn learning courses. You, you mentioned the first one, which you'll yeah. like to. I've got an advanced architecture course that's coming out in later this month or early February in LinkedIn as well. Mm-hmm. And a, uh, uh, I've, I've 
working on a couple other courses and my fifth course is, is in development right now. Um, I, I wrote a book for Redis Labs as well, um, called Catching at Scale with Redis. That's available. That's actually available for free from Redis Labs if you want to get it from them. Um, and uh, I'm working on another book for them as well. So I'm doing lots of new content right now. So check me out at leeatchison.com and see all the different things I'm, I'm, I'm writing about and, uh, and, and see my blog and my InfoWorld articles and everything else there too. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link to all the resources that Lee mentioned in, in the description of wherever you're watching this on YouTube or on the podcast. So uh, please check it out. Thank you so much again, Lee. I hope uh, we talk again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. Have a nice day. Thank you.